Thank you, Steve. Uh, I think the message has been pretty clear. Uh, those of you who saw our Christine Gregoire yesterday, uh, we have an urgent, urgent problem. And the time for transformation is now. And some would argue that the time for transformation is actually behind us, and so we're playing catch up. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking at the data and the science, and it is becoming abundantly clear that the rate at which change is happening to our natural systems is accelerating faster than most of the scientists and certainly most of the public policy folks had predicted. Um, if you think back just a few years ago, the melting of the ice cap was a theoretical possibility in the year 2050. That when one year, one year, that date went from 2050 to 2040 to 2030 to 2020, and now looks at about 2015 or maybe even sooner in the summer. So we've moved the goal posts basically 30 years in the course of one year based on what the data is showing us. And so we have this urgency. And the interesting thing about this conference is that it highlights the need for the interdependency across many, many industries. This is not just a transportation problem. This is a fuel problem and it is a utility market problem because all these things are going to collide. I've spoken with a lot of the power companies across the United States, I've spoken with a number of the auto manufacturers, and they are starting to really understand this problem at a different level than I think if we were sitting here a year ago they would have admitted or talked about. And um, I really encourage all of you who have not seen Shai Agassi speak, he speaks today at lunch, I believe, on his Better Place, and I think there's some folks here from Better Place. Um, his vision is nothing short of transformational. And what he understands is that the public is ready for a change at a huge scale. And if we can just in this room literally unleash the market conditions that enable them to go pursue the behaviors that many of them want to pursue, we will see a mass adoption and a mass change in society. These things can happen very, very rapidly if the infrastructure is in place. And so I think our collective roles is to enable that infrastructure. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just the transportation sector today, although I'm happy if people want to talk and ask questions about other stuff that we're doing. Um, we're going to talk a lot about clean cars, and there's a lot of stuff out, outside to go look at clean cars. The reality is that clean cars in and of themselves are not enough. Um, we could have clean cars everywhere. You know, I, um, I was in China about 20 years ago, my first trip to China, and the only way to get around back then literally was a bicycle, and I rented a bicycle and I went to a number of cities. Um, today, those cities are filled with cars. And if we have any doubt what the future will look like when hundreds of millions of people, literally hundreds of millions of people around the world who cannot afford a vehicle today, but soon will, take to the roads, if they take to the roads in the same paradigm of which we've taken to the roads, we have a massive problem that will spiral well beyond just China. And I know that there was some talk about that yesterday. Uh, and it is very true that we have to lead by example. And we are actively working. And I know Steve and many others in the industry are looking at this problem at a global level. But I do think that the US has a unique opportunity to lead the market here. And so we can transform uh, from here. But if we have clean cars, it's not enough because we still have other issues to think about. Clean cars don't solve congestion. Clean cars do not solve public safety and public health. These things, are st we're still going to have traffic accidents. We have to make sure these things are safe. So when we think about the problem in terms of solving the problem, the way we think about it here is zero miles are the best miles. How do we keep people from actually getting in a vehicle, whether that's a bus, a car, a plane? Zero miles means literally zero miles. Substitution for petrochemical or even electric-based transportation. The next area is shared, and we think about that both in terms of physical space, a bus, a plane. We also think about it in terms of virtual space. How do you use the power of technology, the web and services and business intelligence, to optimize efficiency both in the roads and in the vehicles? And then finally, when you think about getting shared vehicles, how do you get efficient there's a massive amount of software and technology. I don't know if Shai will talk about his auto OS, the OS system that they're working with. But each of these cards that are being built today have a huge, huge amount of componentry that's based on software and services. And one of the examples, there's a little picture here of uh, Fiat, where we have this thing in Europe where we basically do, uh, today it's with a pen drive and it will evolve. Basically, 
It looks at your driving patterns and then gives you tips and tricks and optimizes, helps you optimize both the car and your driving patterns. And this is just sort of the early stages of how we think software and technology integrated with a car operating system can really radically improve efficiency in cars regardless of the fuel source. So zero miles. Something very simple to start with. Before you think about technology and new devices and new hardware, something as simple as calendaring. Right? So we spend a lot of time, and we're spending time with our next version of Office, and we're thinking about how can we actually use the calendar as the first starting point to enable and drive telecommuting. So if you look at this schedule, this is Mark, and for I think Mark's here. Mark actually is uh, our environmental technologist for the company and spends a lot of time thinking about transportation systems. And one of the things we talk about is, how do I leverage the information in my calendar to avoid coming to the office? Because if I can stay home, I can get a lot of work done. And so by literally looking at the blocks of time, uh, and there's color coding options within Outlook that I use as well, you can say, hey, I can, in this calendar, if Mark just moves around a few meetings or makes them telepresence meetings, he's got an opportunity to work from home two, two and a half days a week right off the top. Now, we do a lot of work with BT uh, out of the UK. BT is actually taken the idea of the calendaring and moved to meeting-free days, and now they've gone to the next level. 40%, 40% of their workforce does not go to the office. 40% of their workforce works at home. Now, the thing that we're also thinking about is, well, when each of these meetings get scheduled, very often I'm scheduling them with somebody else at Microsoft. BT realizes this as well. And what they found is that often people were driving to an office, like I'll come to Redmond to meet with other people from Microsoft at Redmond, but we live a half a mile apart in Seattle. So why don't we meet at a coffee shop at a Starbucks in Seattle, or one of our satellite offices, which we have in Seattle. And so the next wave of evolution is to think about how does presence and information about where I live and where I am located come into play and integrate with your calendar. Because I've actually now started to reduce my trips to Redmond quite substantially because I've discovered that many people I meet with, many people I work with, actually live closer to me than we both live here. So travel avoidance. Here's an example. You know, Mark pulled a couple screenshots where he's talking to somebody else on our team. And they said, hey, we need, we need to get together and have a conversation. The call goes to Mark's office. Mark's at home. Redirect. With the power of presence and technology, I can redirect any phone call to any location. I've done this when I've been in Europe. Somebody's calling my office. I see who that person is, and I say, I need to take that call. I hit a redirect, rings to my phone in Europe. Right? I don't need to be anywhere except next to a phone. Ideally, I can actually do this uh, through my PC as well, so I'm not even dependent on the phone lines in any way, shape, or form, because right? it's actually going through the back-end infrastructure of IT. So this is just a scenario that we're starting to see and play with, and more and more people at Microsoft, British Telecom, and a lot of companies around the world are adopting this, because zero miles are the most efficient miles. One other thing that's been a big barrier to distributed meetings is technology. So this is a screenshot of something called a round table. And if you walk around the conference center here, if you go to a conference room in Microsoft, you'll see these everywhere. What it is is basically has seven mirrors, uh, an array of mirrors and microphones. And as a person talks, you'll actually see sort of on the left-hand side here, that person dominates the screen. They can share a presentation. And on the bottom, it stitches together a 360-degree view of the room. All this requires is a laptop, a phone line. And what we are trying to prove with this model is telepresence historically has been a very, very expensive investment. This device is $3,000. Now, for $3,000, you can actually have a meeting with multiple people and have a 360-degree view. More and more laptops actually have this built in. My laptop, I don't have a webcam anymore. It's just built into my laptop. But if you can actually make the technology simple and abundant, and as Ron Sims noted, in Seattle, we have the unique advantage of the fact that about 80% of our citizens are wired up with high-speed connectivity. This paradigm can take hold and can take hold rapidly.